Hello and welcome back. Today I will be demonstrating how to paint a colorful lion using watercolors. I will be using Brescio and Dr. PH Martin's liquid watercolors for this piece, but you can adapt the techniques I show to work with any watercolors that you have. You can see that I've already drawn the image and I've added masking fluid to the areas that I wanted to keep white. Masking fluid is just like a rubber fluid that you put on your paper and it creates a barrier between the paper and the paint and it just keeps any paint from seeping into those areas. I then added yellow brush out to the center of the face and activated it by using a spray bottle. Again you can use whatever watercolors that you have and once the paint is on and sprayed then I tip the board to get it to flow and move to the areas I want it to and I just use a clean rag to clean up any puddles that are forming. I then use a heat tool to help me dry the paper more quickly. Uh, you can just let it dry on its own. A heat tool just speeds up the process. Once the yellow layer is completely dry, I come in and I start adding orange brush -o to the paper and I am activating it again with the spray bottle and I am keeping the paint flowing directionally. I want the, the orange to look like it's hair growing on the face and I want it to go in the direction that the hair would naturally grow. So if you look at the lion, the hair goes more vertical along the bridge of the nose and then it starts fanning out around the skull um, above the eye area and so I'm trying to keep that with the paint, having it go up and up the nose and then kind of flowing to the sides as it gets above the eyes. I then come in with some reds and darker orange colors to start uh, blocking in the area that will become the mane. Um, I'm keeping the, the, main, the paint that is forming the mane uh, flowing away from the face and so I'm controlling that by spraying the water directionally um, in the direction I want it to flow. I am tipping the board to control where the water drips by tilting it if I need it to move and I'm also using my paint paintbrush to control where the paint is going. Uh, this, these are just ways you can control the paint um, with your watercolors in any type of painting situation but especially if you're trying to go more loose like this. I then let that layer of paint dry completely and then come in with masking fluid. This will preserve the paint that is underneath it as I add more wet layers on top. So I want to preserve some of those bright oranges and bright reds and I'm going to be doing a lot of super wet uncontrolled or semi uncontrolled layers of paint over the top and so the masking fluid allows me to preserve those without stressing about ruining all these beautiful colors and highlights that I've been creating. I'm going to continue with this process of doing a layer of paint, letting it dry, more masking fluid to protect areas of the hair that I want to protect, then letting that dry completely and then starting again with the paint and just repeating it over and over and over again. And that's how I'm going to get this really high contrast, colorful, textured hair, especially in the main area of the lion. Um, because it's gonna, I'm going to be able to darken this up and really preserve those highlighted colorful areas as I go along. Once I have blocked in the layers, it's time to come in and start adding some more details to the face. I start with adding more orange and red brush -o, and you can see that I'm using a lot less water than I did at the beginning of the painting. Especially when I'm spraying it, you can see, see I'm using a lot less. That's so I can preserve some of the detail and texture um, of the powdered watercolors. Um, the benefit of using powdered watercolors is that you get these interesting swirls and textures in your painting. And if I, if I sprayed a ton of water, I'd lose a lot of that. So by reducing the amount of water I laid or spray on it, I preserve that texture, which I really, really want to keep. It also is easier to control the paints when there's less water and as you're adding more detail, you want more control. I then come in and add a base layer of pink on the nose and I add a purple ring around the eye. On lions, there's a very dark black ring around their eye where their eyelid and tear duct is. Um, 
And so I'm just marking that with a dark purple right now. I'll darken it up as I go along, but I'm trying not to go too dark at first. The reason why I block these two points in is because they will act as like anchor points to the picture as I'm working. Um, because then I can keep track of where the fur is located on the face and how what direction it will fall. Because if it's under the eye, it will typically fall in a curve around kind of the cheekbone area. I don't know if that's what it's called on a lion, but on a human, <laughs> it'd be like the cheekbone area. If it's going up the bridge of the nose, it will lie in a different direction versus if it's in the front of the nose and coming down. Adding those two points will be really good indicators on how I need to make the fur um, lay on the lion and kind of not lose track of where I am on the piece. Now I'm starting to block in the lion's eye, um, not just the area around it. And lions have a dull yellow eye color and so I mixed up a dull yellow ochreish color with my paints, mixing yellows and purples together. And once that was that layer was drying, I went in and started to darken up that lion's nose, um, the tip of their nose, and then working on the bridge of it with the fur. Now the reason why I'm keeping the lion's eye color the same is because I found that when I keep the, the animal's eye really realistic and have it be realistic colors, whether I'm doing a bear or a dog or whatever it is I'm being asked to do, if I keep the eyes the realistic color, it makes the picture pop more. It's not getting blended in with everything else. It really stands out on its own and it keeps a sense of realism that allows our brains to believe it's the animal and everything else can kind of be more whimsical with color and shape and everything else. So one thing you can see right now that's pretty obvious is that the picture's looking pretty flat. The adding the nose and the eyes have really helped the picture, that line kind of stand out a little bit, but it's still looking pretty flat against the mane and the other colors. And so it's really important to start adding contrast and shadows. Shadows and value are what, and contrast are what give your picture dimension and shape. And so I'm coming in with really dark purples and dark reds and magentas to start building up these shadows. And those will help the lion's face kind of pop out visually and have the hair of the mane and everything recede visually. We're not giving the lion a receding hairline, but we do want the mane to look like it's behind his eyes and behind his nose. And so giving, putting those in shadows and darkening them up will help the, the, the nose and everything come forward. Value is such an important part of art and it's such an important thing to learn. That's why most of your art classes, especially once you start getting into um, high school and college, they have you start with just black and white. You either start with doing charcoal pictures or graphite drawings or black and white paintings because value is what changes a circle, uh, just a basic circle drawn on a piece of paper to a sphere with lighting coming from the top left. And it doesn't matter what color it is, it matters how light and dark it is. And so if you are working on a picture and things just aren't quite looking right, um, you can't get your white paint to stand out against bright enough against the colors next to it, um, that means that you, there's something going on with the value. And so I often will take a, a black and white photo of of my picture I'm working on on my phone and that will give me a really good idea of what things are standing out and what things um, need um, extra contrast in. Um, another way to tell if something needs more contrast is to like prop it up and take a few steps back and kind of squint at it. That will kind of diffuse what's going on and help you see what things are standing out and what things aren't. So those are just tricks to help you really see what areas need work on. Um, and if your highlights are not bright enough, if you're using like pure white paint for your highlight and it's not standing out, that means that your the colors around it aren't dark enough and you need to darken up those areas because you can't make pure white paint any brighter than it already is. 
The only way you can control the value is by darkening up the things around it. So while I've been on my little importance of value soapbox, I have been adding more layers of paint to this picture. Um, I've been darkening up areas, especially around the main, and just really working on those values that I was just chatting about. And you can see that I've also sprayed quite a bit of water on this picture especially over by the main. That's because it was getting a little too harsh in the lines um, for where I wanted it to be at this point in the painting. And so by just squirting a little bit of water on it, that allowed the paint to blend and move together. The paint that was already on the paper and the paint that I am adding. And it just helps soften up those edges. Um, I'm also darkening up the right side of the face. That will be the side of the face that's more in shadow. And so that's the side I need to be darker to help create some more of that dimension. So this piece came about because I really needed to kind of get back in the habit of painting in this style. Um, I have a few commissions lined up in this style of painting and I hadn't painted in it for a while. It's kind of the story of my life. It seems like my commissions go in spurts of what style my client wants me to paint in. And so I'll do a bunch in one style and then I'll get a spurt of a bunch of clients wanting to paint, have me paint in a different style. And I have to find a way to kind of shift my brain to think in that different style. I don't know if that makes sense, but you, whether I'm painting realistic with watercolors or I'm painting in this more loose, colorful way, or I'm working with pastels and I'm doing a landscape versus a pastel portrait, each style kind of takes different skills and you approach it slightly different. And so I have to kind of shift my brain to think of those approaches. And so um, this piece was my attempt to kind of shift my brain back into these colorful animal watercolor portraits. And I'm, I really, there's some things I would probably tweak about it and change. And I'm gonna use this as inspiration to do some large scale animal portraits kind of to the scale of the large wave painting I did. And for those that, that haven't seen the video on that, that painting was almost three feet by three feet in size. And I would love, 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 love to do some animal portraits in that size. So that's one of my goals for, for this year is to kind of do some animal pieces like this in a massive size. So as I've been chatting, you've seen me do some more layers of painting and I've been just working away at this. I've reinforced the shadows and the dark rings or circles around the eyes and the nose. I've started adding more detail around the face. I'm keeping more brush strokes visible and having them kind of be indications of fur lines and really starting to add the detail to help this lion's face kind of pop. I've also darkened up along the mane quite a bit, and I've just continued to work away at this. So um, I didn't mention why I use two types of watercolor paints when I'm uh, for this painting. Um, so I thought I'd explain that a little bit as I'm just continuing to add details, looking at my reference photos to see where shadows are, and adding the details for the hair and such. Um, the reason why I use two different types of paints is because I want to maximize the best of both. Um, Brusho is a really fun way to get loose, flowing color on your paper. It's really a great way to add texture and kind of get me out of like a super serious watercolor mindset. Um, and, and just let me have fun with colors and just laying them down. I don't particularly love mixing brusho, and I don't really love doing detail work with brusho, especially since it's super, super stainy. Um, but I find that it works really well with my Dr. P.H. Martin's uh, Hydrus watercolors because they're very vibrant watercolors, and they're also very flowy and organic. In I can get very organic, fun blends with them. Um, but I can mix them easier, I can reactivate them easier, and I have a lot of control over how they work. So I just find that when I use both of them together, I get, for me, the results that I want the most. Now I've done similar styles of painting 
with just my tube watercolors or just my PH Martin watercolors and that's just fine. You can adapt these techniques and use whatever you have. That's just, since I have both on hand, that's what I just choose to use. So once I have um, most of the painting done and it's all dried, I decided it was time to remove the masking fluid. And you can see the really cool layers of masking fluid that we have and the texture that it that gives. Now, if I was doing this on a bigger scale, I'd be able to keep a lot more of those cool color blends that we masked off um, more visible. But with this being smaller, I have to I have to lose some of that detail to make everything fit in and everything like recede how it's supposed to be. So there's a lot of white, stark white standing out and it's battling for our attention. Um, a lot of artists won't use pure white except for the highlight of an eye and everything else has to be values less or slightly darker than that. And so keeping that in mind, I am starting to darken up a lot of the highlights that we preserved. Now they're not going to be all super dark. I'm just um, starting to knock back their brightness so that the things that are most important to stand out, like the white along its mouth and nose and around its eye stand out more. So I'm rewetting the paper, letting some of those colors just naturally flow in. I'm, and I darkened up underneath the mouth, which I will do some more in a little bit. Um, once I sprayed it and it dried, I started coming in with a little bit of ink. Um, this is Dr. P.H. Martin's Bombay inks, and I've just dyed the ink um, pink and orange to kind of match the line and just add a little bit more detail um, specifics to the mane and how it lays and just kind of make minor adjustments as I go along. Now, um, as I was working, I, I really wanted um, some more of the purple color pulled into the painting and so I used a little bit of brush -o over the top with that and then use my other paints along with it. Um, it's, I'm never like completely done with like just I'm done with brush -o and I never come back to it. It's kind of a give and take. Um, it's, it's a lot like cooking where you sample what you've created and then you see if it needs a different seasoning and then it cooks a little bit longer and then you adjust it as you go along. Painting is a similar process. Um, there's no one hard or fast rule that will work. It, it really depends on what you're creating. And I love adjusting for the individual need of that particular painting. So once the, that layer was dried, then I started fine tuning the detail around the eye because that's where I wanted the most detail for this painting because that's what's going to help this painting pop. I also worked on refining the details on the nose and mouth because those are also important areas to have the detail strong because you want the things that are closest to you to have the most detail and then everything else that you don't want to focus on as much or they're further away, you don't want as much detail in those areas. So that's why I kept softening up the lines in the mane and that's why I'm working so hard to sharpen and add details to the eyes and the nose because those are the main focus. Everything else is just extra. So now I'm coming in with some white ink and I'm starting to reinforce some of the highlights along the nose and the chin area and in the eyes. I really want the eyes to look very reflective and I also wanted to bringing back some of the highlights at the very tips of the hairs that are right at the bottom of his mouth or jaw. I also used the ink to reinforce the whiskers and give them uh, more strength or weight because they were kind of blending into all the lines of the mane and so they needed to be a little bit thicker and a little bit stronger of color to help them stand out. So I'm at the tail end of working on this piece and I'm starting to take like take steps back and look and see what needs to be adjusted 
and then coming back and tweaking those and just kind of doing this back and forth dance of looking at the painting in different ways to see what needs to be tweaked. Um, I noticed that the the right side needed to be darkened up because it wasn't looking like it was in shadow enough and so I'm just adjusting that and adding shadows among uh, different clumps of hair within the mane so those um, don't look too flat and without dimension. I then took a couple hour break and did some other things, changed my clothes as you can see by my sleeve and coming back with fresh eyes helped me see a little bit more of what needed to be adjusted. Um, if you are having a hard time telling what needs to be fixed on your painting and you know it's not quite right, or even if you think it looks great, taking a break really helps you see it with fresh eyes and see what needs to be adjusted. But here is the finished line piece and I hope you enjoyed the painting. And if you did, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more of what I create, please hit the subscribe button. I hope you have a great day. Bye.